Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. Over this past weekend, SWAT teams, military contractors, and many more groups from all over the world met in Oakland, California for the 7th Annual Urban Shield. That's actually just a training and weapons expo. Urban Shield, however, wasn't welcomed by all. More than 30 community groups, some from families of victims killed by police forces, protested outside the event. Now joining us to discuss all this is Kimber Heinz. She's a national organizer with the War Resistance League and the Facing Tear Gas campaign. Thanks for being with us, Kimber. Thanks for having me. So, Kimber, just give us a brief explanation of what Urban Shield is and who's behind it. Sure. Um, Urban Shield is a, a massive meeting and expo for over 100 police and military agencies and units, uh, mostly in the California area for this, in this particular case, but also across the U.S. there are several involved and in, uh, internationally there are multiple international guests to this year's Urban Shield. And it's sponsored by a number of what they call vendors, um, what many of us would call war profiteers, people and groups that you've probably heard of um, from Lockheed Martin to ATK, which manufactures depleted uranium for the U.S. military, to Colt weapons, which maybe many of uh, your viewers have heard about Colt guns in the context of U.S. militarism, um, to one of our campaign targets, Safari Land, which creates uh, non-lethal, quote unquote, weapons like tear gas and, and stun grenades and this kind of thing for uh, police units around the world. And they're essentially showcasing their wares and providing training opportunities for SWAT teams uh, throughout this weekend uh, in what they call a disaster response, uh, a disaster, a disaster response test and training. So, what we would call a repression marketplace for for these various companies and government agencies to to meet one another and practice their techniques. How does Urban Shield actually facilitate, or I should say, impact this repression in, in other countries and in the United States? Well, they provide training grounds. So, uh, for example, they'll have one training where, I mean, this was a past year, uh, an animal rights group, according to this particular training, had held a number of people hostage in a, a room somewhere in a, in a company uh, that was testing on animals. And essentially the police were being trained in how to respond to this as a SWAT team type scenario. Um, that's something that's pretty common, these types of training scenarios involving bomb threats or what you know police would call a terrorist threats um, is one, one example. And also because they have a number of international police units and agencies involved in this, this year's case, it's uh, police from Israel, Guam, Brazil, among others, who, of course, are notorious for, um, in recent years, and for in some cases a lot longer than that, repressing the people who live um, in their country, uh, that they are actually being trained in the latest techniques as well in repression and meeting a lot of the companies that they are able to then do business with in order to acquire some of the, the weapons technology that they use against popular uprisings and people on the streets where um, wherever they are. What do you see as the motives behind the militarization of police forces? Well, that's a question that we're asking ourselves a lot more um, as the organizing against the militarization of the police is growing. Um, we know that in terms of local militarization of the police in the U.S., it's grown a lot since the 80s and the war on drugs. That's um, something that's gone from 3,000 SWAT team raids per year to over 50,000 per year, and that's being documented. Um, there is a huge industry behind it, as we're mentioning with a lot of the corporate sponsors like like Lockheed Martin, like Safari Land. There, there's a, a profitability behind this, and, and more so is profitability in this particular historical moment where, of course, with the 80s, the war on drugs was huge, but now, uh, since... Around 2011, when we have a time of, of massive uh, social uprising, beginning with the Arab Spring, through Occupy, um, through some of the protests that we've seen over the summer, for example, in Brazil or in Turkey, um, the student movement in, in, in Quebec, the Red Squares movement, 
all these different movements, there's actually now an understanding that this is a time of uprising and that not only can you make money by repressing people in these uprisings, but they are a threat to the powers that be. And I think that more and more money is being put into uh, these this kind of funding of police forces that, you know, in some cases will disappear people, incarcerate them, put them in detention centers. But in some cases, especially in terms of these popular uprisings, these massive gatherings of people and, and protests will will violently squash them with all kinds of new technology that they, they learn about in places like Urban Shield. Okay, Kimber Hines, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.